ファミリーコンピュータのフルーツの忍びフルーツスライスアクション何千年もの楽しみフルーツの忍び I recreated Fruit Ninja for the NES. This isn't an NES or 8 bit style game. This is a real 48 kilobyte game that anyone with an NES and a zapper can play. Fruit Ninja is one of the great, if not the best, mobile game from the classic iPhone era, with estimated lifetime downloads across all platforms reaching nearly 2 billion. I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that I miss the feeling of simple arcade action. That's also the philosophy behind 1983's Nintendo Entertainment System, called the Family Computer in Japan. It literally brought arcade games like Donkey Kong, Punch Out, and Mario Bros. into your home. But bringing a modern mobile game onto a 40 year old platform has its difficulties. The entire project can be written in C, there are compilers for that, but I prefer to write NES games in 6502 assembly. The NES system itself has plenty of constraints too, like the fact its display resolution is limited to 256 by 240, and that only 64 sprites can display on the screen at a time. Which seems fine until you realize that each sprite is only 8 by 8 pixels in size, so in a game like Kirby's Adventure, Kirby is 16 pixels tall and wide, meaning he's composed of 4 separate sprites. So let me begin by designing the fruit. After all, Fruit Ninja without fruit would just be Ninja Gaiden, I guess. But the fundamental question I have to ask here is how big do I make the fruit? Each fruit being only 8x8 pixels is probably too small, and I do want to make this compatible with the NES Zapper, so the target needs to be a decent size. The ducks in Duck Hunt are 32x32 pixels large. That's 16 sprites of duck, probably less because of white space, but at that size, it means that it max four fruit on the screen at a time, much less than what I want. So perhaps the happy medium here is eight sprites per fruit. The thing is, though, every fruit needs to be able to split in half. Just like in the game. So I'll designate four sprites for the left and four for the right, and then overlap them until they get sliced. Color is also a limitation on the system. While the NES can display 64 colors, many of them are just black, and this one in particular will cause image stability problems, so don't use that one. I also can't use all the colors at the same time either. Each sprite is tied to one of the four color palettes, each with four colors, but oh wait, this one actually doesn't count because it's transparent. The only real background color is this first color in the four background color palettes, but we'll come back to that in a second. So, with a little planning for the color palettes, I can create the following fruit. Bananas, coconuts, watermelons, limes, peaches, mangoes, lemons, oranges, kiwis, strawberries, dragon fruit, pomegranates, and apples. All that artwork is broken up into eight sprites per fruit, and each of those sprites I store in the game cartridge on the character ROM chip. For more on that, check out some of my other NES videos. Let's talk about backgrounds quickly. Backgrounds work differently from sprites. Let's look at a small scale example first. Say the NES only outputs a resolution of 16 by 16. That means there would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 8 by 8 tiles here. Each blank tile is fitted with a single sprite from character ROM. These sprite numbers, let's say 80, 81, 80, 82, constitute what's called a name table. Unlike sprites, which are free to move around independently, the background moves together as a rigid body. Now, expand the 16x16 background to a 256x240 background, and I have a 32x30 tile grid to fill in with sprites from character ROM. I designed this first background in Photoshop, then used a program called NES Screen Tool to generate both the character ROM graphics and the name table for me. So, finally, getting to writing some actual code here. I use my boilerplate program from my NES tutorial video as a jumping off point to add in my many fruit sprites and store my background's name table in the proper section of memory. It's then only a matter of math to create an arc for the fruit to fly by. The NES's constraints can also be beneficial sometimes. Notice how my banana wraps around the screen? Well, I didn't explicitly program it to do that. Each sprite's X and Y are determined by a single byte ranging from 0 to 255, but when I continue to increase this value and it overflows, it just wraps around to 0, so it will warp to the other side of the screen. As for the fruit's arc itself, I did a little experimenting with linear, parabolic, and trigonometric arcs and found that what worked best was the sine function. Although there is no math library for the NES, so this sign function is a result of using a lookup table, a fancy way of saying I did the math somewhere else and wrote it down to copy from later. 
With one fruit in the bag, it isn't that complicated to have eight fruit flying on the screen all at once. But I do run into another constraint. Only eight sprites display per horizontal scan line, meaning if you have nine sprites in a row, the ninth doesn't show up. This is easily fixed by moving the order of the sprites around so that the last will be first and the first last. Running at 60 frames a second, by constantly switching back and forth it creates this flickering effect that is obvious to the human eye, but hard to capture on camera. If something is filmed at 30 frames per second, then it doesn't capture half the flicker. Here's a screen capture of the program in real time at 30 fps. It looks like chunks are missing from the fruit, but this is what it looks like when I slow it down. You can clearly see which sprites are switching back and forth. Luckily in an emulator, I can allow for more than 8 sprites per scan line, which I check for the sake of video capture here. The next step now is making use of the NES Zapper. Let's take a look at how it's done in a game that most people will be familiar with, Duck Hunt. I'll open it up in the NES emulator I like best, FCEUX, which allows me to use the computer mouse to simulate the NES Zapper via click. Maybe that wasn't caught very well on video, so let's slow it down again. When I fire the zapper, the screen goes black for a single frame. Then for each duck on the screen it will display a white rectangle. On that frame, if the zapper senses light, then it will register a hit. Breaking it down even further, the NES zapper is usually plugged into the second controller port, and so can be checked by reading memory address 4017. Of the one byte signal it gives, only three bits are used, and only two of those are relevant for what I'm doing here. This first bit detects when the trigger is pulled halfway, not all the way, but halfway. Once I detect the signal, I can begin the process of turning the screen black. This second bit is a little more complicated to read because it changes at subframe speeds. Take a look at this test program I created for the light gun. It can clearly detect when I pull the trigger, but it can't seem to tell when the zapper is detecting light or not. So let me slow this process down even further than frame by frame to see what's happening on the screen. In a cathode ray tube TV, electrons travel from an electron gun to shine through a fluorescent screen and produce a point of color. This builds the screen line by line until it finishes the whole image. It does all this in one frame of time. The position of the gun is then reset and the whole image is drawn again. This all happens so fast that our human brains process it as though it occurred all at once. The NES zapper, however, is not a human, and the light sensor inside of it does not detect light at a frame by frame time scale. At the speed of flying electrons, light and electricity, it near instantly flips the bit saying, I see the light, and just as quickly turns it off again when that light disappears. What this means for the program is that once the trigger has been set, my program is on babysitting the light gun mode, continuously asking if it sees the light until it does, or it doesn't, and a frame of time passes and the program can return to normal. With that knowledge, here is my working demo. And let me also point out that it's important to turn the whole screen black for this. In the modern age of OLED, perhaps we've forgotten a time where black meant don't show any light through this section of the screen. But the NES Zapper has not forgotten. If the background is any other color, like it is here, then it still detects light. So back to the game. In real time when I shoot the Zapper at the screen, that's what it looks like. In slow motion here, it cycles through each fruit, and if it detects that it was sliced, then it splits like that. And because every fruit is flashed individually, if they overlap, then you can slice both of them at the same time, resulting in a combo. And just like in the real game, a combo will result in more points, with 4 points for 3 fruit sliced at the same time, 8 for 4, and if the stars align and you slice all 8 fruit at once, that's a 128 point combo. But you'll have to work up to that, because the game will throw one fruit once, then two fruit twice, then three thrice, and so on until it maxes out at eight. At this point, I added a title screen to the game as well, calling it Fruit Shinobi, and the game starts when the trigger is pulled on the gun. Each round of fruit slicing lasts until you miss three fruits, kept track of by the counter here, or until you hit a bomb and then... This effect was created by first scrolling the screen randomly several times, and then turning off sprites and the background, while also changing the universal background color to white. Then this screen will award you coins based on how many points you earned. Remember in the early days of Fruit Ninja, where you could unlock different blades and backgrounds just through playing the game? Well, I want to bring back some of that. So for every 8 points the player earns, they get 1 coin. Also notice how this coin is seemingly changing to much more than 12 colors. 
This is a little trick where I exchange the colors in the palette for new ones on the fly, giving the appearance of more colors than possible. It's a common trick used even in the original Super Mario Bros. However, I can't use this trick with fruit around, because then you'd have a green banana or a green orange, something ridiculous. Back to the coins. From the title screen, you can use these to buy different backgrounds to slice fruit to, including my favorite background, the old map of Japan, which turns the whole game into grayscale, which apparently is just a feature of the NES that I've hardly seen used, but by literally flipping a single bit, it will wipe out all color from the system. But there are plenty of other great backgrounds that I designed as well, although they don't do much in the way of affecting the game. And if you want to see them for yourself, then the link is down below for you to download and try it out. If you have any ideas on what you'd like to see in a future update to the game, or if you just have any ideas you want to see me create, then let me know down below in the comments. And if you want to see more like this, then please subscribe, and until next time, thanks for watching.